five. Can I have your attention, please? Code blue, east one. Life-saving care amid the pandemic. You don't know what happens with these patients when they're going on life support because we don't know if they'll ever get off. People were essentially asleep for weeks. I owe my life to them. I don't want to take this back to my family. I don't want to hurt anyone else. We've had colleagues uh, lose their lives. Man. I know for sure that the world I left behind is dead and gone. Jailed for life and trying to come home. You can't just put an 18-year-old in jail for life. We only want our sons close enough to be able to see him. I want him to be able to come home. CTV's W5 with Avery Haynes, Sandy Ronaldo, and Lisa Laflamme. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to a special edition of W5. This is the one place where no one wants to end up, the COVID intensive care unit. Wearing a mask is now mandatory in this hospital, and especially here where every single patient is connected to a ventilator. The toll of fighting this disease is harrowing, not only for the patients who have it, but also for the medical teams who are trying to save them. The silence is eerie. The patients here don't speak. They are heavily sedated and medically paralyzed inside negative pressure rooms. No sounds of visiting families, just the steady beeping of machines doing what the patients can no longer do, breathe. Blue, that silence is pierced by the dreaded code blue. Code blue east one. Someone's heart has stopped. No, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'm bringing it's it. Coming. The COVID team grabs the crash cart and deploys to another ward of the hospital. Code blues are what this team is trained for. COVID-19 is all new. In healthcare during COVID, we are uh, building an airplane while we're flying it. So you got a good mean, he's still tacky, he's febrile. Dr. Barry Nathanson has been doing rounds for 25 years in the ICU at South Lake Regional Health Centre in Newmarket, north of Toronto. He and his team are learning on the job how to treat those most ravaged by the mysterious virus. How difficult is this for you to be dealing with this with so much unknown day in and day out? We know that the mortality in COVID is high. We're learning that it may be higher even than we feared. It's not easy work, but it is powerful and it does lead to emotions and there are tears. The code blue has been dealt with and now... The vent is alarming because it's not showing any inhalation. A very young COVID patient on the other side of the glass has stopped breathing, even with a ventilator. I will try to wake her up. Which means full protection is needed to go in and investigate. So she stopped breathing for a time there, the alarms went off. Yeah. Uh, now I see her, she's coughing. Yeah. The respiratory therapist suctions and anxiously gestures for her to breathe. There's two. There you go. There's three. Dr. Nathanson watches over. As yet another crisis is averted. Good job, Denny. And now he can begin his rounds. His heart rate's come up a bit. Okay. Get a sense of how he tolerates having a reduced level of sedation to see if there's any room to maneuver at all after almost a month on this machinery. He's been going back and forth. Yeah, I don't strange. want to keep on paralyzing him over and over and over. And we're kind of skating in an unhappy yeah. territory and we're not making any progress either, are we? No. Before COVID, the ICU might have the odd patient on a ventilator for a few short days. But COVID patients are hooked up on the life support for weeks. Given that we're well into ventilation, 25 days or so, we might be able to get her trained. Sounds good. Excellent. So he's not anywhere near where we thought he would be today, right? So, you know, the expectation yesterday when we intubated him, 
was that this morning we'd be able to reduce the sedation, do a sedation vacation, and get him extubated precipitously, and he's nowhere close to that. So if you're good, I'm gonna move on. Very good, let's keep going. We made a promise to the hospital not to identify any of the patients here in the ICU, but looking into the rooms, I can tell you that it's disturbing to see just how young the people are. In this room, a woman in her early 30s. And in fact, on this day, there's no one in this unit over the age of 61. It's been a huge surprise. We were expecting uh, elderly people um, to fit a certain pattern. And it was, it's been very surprising, and it's been very difficult to realize over time that on average these folks are much younger than we'd expected. It's incredibly difficult to look in and see such a young face. It is difficult. And yeah, there are cases that make me see that, you know, that, that could be me or mine or someone close to me. That's never far away. COVID doesn't really care who you are, it just cares about replicating. Ed Anderson is a respiratory therapist. Why do they call what you do here one of the most dangerous roles for COVID treatment? We basically have our face right beside the uh, endotracheal tube, which is connected to their lungs. If they were to cough, all of that will come up in our face. Also, when we're doing the proning, they're connected to the life support uh, or the ventilator, as we call it. If that circuit disconnects, it's just going to shower us with all of that spray, which puts us at high, high risk of getting COVID. Proning is when patients are flipped into different positions. Just watch your line there. A last-ditch attempt to get more oxygen when the respirator, even at 100%, isn't enough. What's been the toughest case for you? Uh, toughest for me was my first time recently withdrawing care. Uh, I was a young mother with a young child at home, an infant at home. Uh, and so that, that hit hard. Yeah. Previously healthy, and she ended up... Uh, succumbing to her illness and the family wanted to withdraw so uh, we withdrew care they can't take a toll and it's never easy but it's part of our job after weeks on the front line of the war on covid ed is suffering i actually had to take myself to emerge one day because the anxiety was giving me chest pain there's the fear because i don't want to take this back to my family i don't want to hurt anyone else a lot of Family and friends, they're contacting us. Oh, sorry. Uh, co-workers, we're saying we love you. Do you want a minute? Huh? If you want a minute, you can take a minute. Heads up. Yeah, give me two seconds. <laughs> sorry. Normally I'm good with this, but... Uh, Is it just yeah. that it's it just it's overwhelming to, to sort of talk it's about it? It's like so stressful, just I already have a stressful job. And then additionally to it, it's heartbreaking. You know, you don't know what happens with these patients when they're going on life support because we don't know if they'll ever get off. So Patricia spoke to the family mm -hmm. and we are going to withdraw care on her. Is anybody close enough to come in or I'm assuming they'll? No. It's just us? Yeah. Just not having family here is the saddest thing in the world. Yeah. Time and again, families are making the tough decision to end life support after weeks without improvement. Just a few rooms down, another decision is made to turn the machines off. What's this like for you and the team? This is a particularly powerful and poignant loss because he's been, he's been in our family here, in our home here for a month. And we have, we've given ourselves to him. We've done everything we can possibly do for him. It will be intensely, intensely sad. And we'll move on. Behind that curtain, a once healthy man in his early 60s has lost his battle against the virus. One of our very first patients. And we have, even though he's been on the machinery and unconscious, we form a bond with these people. And we have a vision. I have a vision of what he was before this. And my vision, my goal was to get him back to that. That's what, that's what we do. And it became pretty clear gradually over time that that wasn't going to be achievable. And so the team holds on to the victories. 
Julianne Cabuenas was the very first person this team had to intubate when the COVID ICU ward first opened. Just 39 years old, a mother of four-year-old twins, COVID stole her ability to breathe. And I remember looking at Julie right in the eyes, and I remember seeing that fear. And we didn't know if she was going to see her family again. She didn't know if she was going to see her family again or wake up and come off the machine. The numbers were very unfavorable, but we knew what we had to do. Unfavorable because here only half the ventilated patients have survived. Julianne spent two weeks on the ventilator. You're standing. And then this. Hi, I'm standing finally after what? How many days? Julianne made a vow. I will fight for my children. They're everything to me. I fought my life for them. With such little good news from the ICU, the entire hospital lined the hallways to cheer. Just to even watch her just like walk out of the hospital is like absolutely incredible. As Julianne was finally reunited with her husband and twins. Her children were going to get their mom back. Her husband was going to get his spouse back. It's one thing to put your life and your health and your well-being on the line for someone when you have confidence I get that they're going to get well. But it didn't help not knowing if we were going to be doing all that to no avail. So once we saw that, it just kind of, we wind in our sails. <laughs> kind of learning on the job, aren't you? Completely. Staying ahead of a deadly disease. Our, our greatest fear is that people will no longer abide by these public health directives. When W5 continues. Daybreak at the South Lake Regional Health Centre in Newmarket, Ontario, less than an hour north of Toronto. Dr. Barry Nathanson is about to start another 12-hour shift inside the COVID intensive care unit. And so the vents are kind of stuck and we're waiting for her to awaken. She's not really interacting as much. The best I got from her was when her daughter was on the phone. She actually tracked her head and her eyes towards the telephone, but that was on Friday. As Dr. Nathanson does his rounds, there is rarely good news, and often his days are filled with phone calls, gently telling families to prepare for the worst. And for those who do survive, little is known about the long-term effects of having the disease and of being sedated and medically paralyzed for so long. Come on, Marcus, jump. <laughs> For Julianne Cabuenas, who didn't know if she would ever see her children again, the recovery has been slow. Julianne, you've been home from the hospital for th three weeks now. What has your recovery been like? Physically, it's, it's challenging in a way that I cannot do the things that I normally do. Um, my, my arm is, my left arm is really weak. I'm still limping. I do have a lot of memory loss. I, I believe it's the effect of the, um, the drugs. But it's the emotional impact that is the hardest to deal with. As she was coming off the heavy sedation, Julie Ann had vivid hallucinations that her children were dead. It's hunting me. It's hunting me every time. Like, there's no day that I don't ask my husband, like, is this real? Am I not dreaming? Am I really alive? I'm here, right? I always sleep with the lights on because I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared to be alone. Um, but I ask my husband to, to sleep beside me and um, to check every time if I'm breathing or not. It's a journey. <laughs> it's, a, it's a process. But, but I'm better. I'm better. <laughs> Sweetheart, I'm gonna do some stretches with you today, okay? Jen Watson is a physical therapist who works in the ICU. She helped Julianne regain her physical strength after coming off the ventilator. Here, she's moving the muscles of an unconscious woman who's been on life support for six weeks. Up and down, side to side. Then we're gonna take this wrist, we're gonna go across. 
So we go into the room and we lift them up into the chair and position them there and, and do bed exercises as well. Good work. You're doing all of this though with people who are not conscious. Yes, sometimes they are sedated and that's the tricky bit because we have to find that nice fine line between when they are sedated and to be able to do things like basic stuff like squeeze your hand and blink on command or nod yes and no. Leslie DePoe is a nurse who is intimately involved in post-ventilator care. Humulant of R, regular. And says it's not just getting the muscles moving again. Waking up from the COVID nightmare can be traumatizing. These people have been on an, an exceptional amount of sedation, sometimes further medications required to paralyze their body so that the machine can actually do what it needs to do. People were essentially asleep for weeks, you know. For some people, they wake up and are just finding out that this is what's happened to them and where are their families. There's a ton of reorientation, lots of going in there and reminding them you're totally safe. It's April, it's not March anymore. You know, there's a lot of that. Most of the COVID patients on this ward spend at least three weeks on a ventilator. This isn't normally something we'd have go on for that long, but we just know these patients are needing it longer than, than other conditions might have. The long-term complications from being on a ventilator, being on those paralytic drugs. We just don't often see people that are vented for that long on that much sedation because this is all brand new. So long term, how are these patients recovering? So it would be a great thing to go back in six months and we'll have hopefully some more data and in a year and in five years and in 10 years. But it's, I think it's too soon to tell because it's an anomaly up until this point to have somebody under those, under those circumstances for that long. What do you have to say to the nurses and doctors and respiratory therapists and physiotherapists who saved your life? Well, I wouldn't be here without them. I would like to thank them from the bottom of my heart for taking care of me. Um, like, I owe my life to them. And I wouldn't be with my kids without your love and care for us. So thank you. I love you guys. I love you. <laughs> there is so much still to learn about how to treat this disease. And doctors are also noticing that some people are coming in without the typical symptoms of dry cough, fever, and headache. Kind of learning on the job, aren't you? Completely. Dr. Completely. Stephanie Tsi works on the COVID medicine ward, treating patients who aren't sick enough for the ICU. Is there some that you at least expect that would be a COVID positive and they come in with a different presentation completely? Um, and then by chance you find out that they're positive. There have been a few that with again, kind of neurological symptoms or just generalized weakness. One of her patients, an 84-year-old man, came in with signs of a stroke. So we weren't uh, expecting COVID whatsoever. Uh, more blurry vision, um, some dizziness, uh, weakness. And he didn't have any of the typical symptoms that you expect. How's he doing now? Perfect, he's doing great. And so today, after seven days in hospital, Leonard Johnson, who has never before been away from his wife of 60 years, is going home. Were you scared this past week, Leonard? You got a disease that everyone's talking yes, about. Yes, I was terrified. But it seems as though you've done really well with this, right? You're... Oh, yes, yes. Overall, I've come out pretty good. Yeah, compared to others, I'm very fortunate. South Lake Hospital has not seen the much feared surge. Instead, it's been a steady and never-ending wave of new patients. They have enough ventilators. You should have a mask on. They're closely monitoring their supply of personal protective equipment. And they've also set up these special COVID tents, just in case. When you're walking in, go to bed one, them. you'll see them right here. There you go. How many more PPOs do you think you would need in here? The stress, though, extends from the front lines to the CEO of the hospital, Arden Crystal. You know, there was a scene that I witnessed in the ICU when it was a man that they were just about to intubate, and he was conscious. And I looked at him through, through the, the glass, and the fear in his eyes, um, literally, I, I had to turn away and I, I, had, to, I had to leave because I, it made me so emotional because I could think about, I could see what he was thinking. He was thinking, am I going to wake up? 
and um, I can only imagine what that feels like. It seems as though that there, there could be a breaking point for the staff, especially mm -hmm. in the ICU. How do you make sure that they don't reach that breaking point? We have a mental health and wellness team that people can just uh, call up and see immediately if they feel stressed. Uh, and we, we go around and we round and we ask people how they're doing. They've also started doing this. A stress-busting dance party every morning at 11. All of the normal activities that we would do to help reduce our stress, you know, get to the gym and exercise, see our friends and family, all those things are not possible. And so to be able to have some fun with your work family is a little bit of a replacement. Back in the intensive care unit. Which line? Top one. Two. Dr. Nathanson has a call Hi. from a nearby hospital. What's up? All I can tell you is we will make it happen, but I got to figure out how. Bye. You know about a patient from another hospital coming? I know that they um, are having a struggle and they yeah. were asking for some help and Kaelin was going to get back to me. They're in surge and they need help, so we need to take somebody. Okay, I'll okay. follow up. Thank you. With some empty beds here, they can help out. Hospitals in the area have been trading off patients when one gets overwhelmed. The patient is COVID positive. Okay. There is no way of knowing when this will end, and the team here is worried about what happens next. What's your concern if things open up too soon, as it relates to what could happen in here? Our greatest fear is that we would open up our society too early and therefore risk a second wave. We're relying on the people who throw accolades and honors at us. That doesn't really help. If you really want to honor healthcare workers, then follow public health directives and recommendations. Our lives will come back, but we need to do it in a measured way, slowly and carefully. But if that surge does happen, the team at South Lake Hospital is ready. 60 doctors from other specialties have been retrained and will be redeployed here to the COVID ICU.